All right, let's wrap up. So we're going to look a little bit on fabrication of MOSFETs, since that's really what's driving the, in the uh, industry today, especially in terms of scaling them to smaller sizes. And so people are now pushing to 12-inch and 18-inch diameter fabrication, where you can see each of these little squares on here is an individual chip. And so this is a 300 millimeter line, 12 inch line of Texas Instruments, for instance. And so let's say that it's your, you're, you're this person here and it's your first day at the job and you get for your process 90% yield, meaning 90% of the chips come out good. Just the chips, not the wafer itself, come out good with the process you do. And there's 50 other people, each with one step, needed to make this chip. And, and in practice, it's much more. It's like 100 steps, okay? So what's the net yield? Well, if everyone was that good at 90% yield, you would find that the total yield would be 0.9 to the 50th, which is equal to 0 0.005, which is, point, which is 0.5%, meaning that if they sold the chips that you made at that fab for, let's say, $200 each, then the cost for them has gone up not 20 times, but 200 times, so you're now selling these things for a total of uh, $40,000, if I did the math right. So now you're basically selling really expensive chips. So you can see, just from a manufacturing cost perspective, how yield really drives, uh, drives the uh, issues that you deal with in a fabrication facility. Um, again, what they're doing versus time is they're trying to make process uh, microprocessors smaller and smaller in terms of the minimum feature size so this is the number that they can pack on a chip versus year you can see they've been able to follow this nice nicely and this has worked great because you can get more processing power onto a given amount of, uh, of chip size but the problem is they run into uh, power dissipation so modern chips they don't drive them any faster than they did a while ago because if they they keep putting more processors, so you get more computing power, but not higher speeds, because the core temperatures are getting too hot. And so there's some nice apps even out there on your laptops, etc., that monitor the temperature of the core, and you can see it go up and down as you increase or decrease processing on it. And again, if the semiconductor gets too hot, you get too much thermal generation of carriers, you can lose your effective doping types, and then the processor can fail. Again, the reason we also like to make transistors smaller, this is versus year and the minimum feature size going down, is that basically smaller devices gives you both a reduced resistance, shorter channel length, and reduced capacitance, so smaller gate capacitor. So you get faster and lower power devices. Um, the faster doesn't necessarily work out, unfortunately, but you can reduce the amount of power per individual logic switch. Some of the things they're also doing, if, if this is a MOSFET here, you can see in between them they've done this trans isolation where they'll etch down into the substrate and they'll fill it with a low capacitance material to I, I mean a high a, yeah, low capacitance material to isolate one transistor from the next from the next. And so all the parasitic capacitance and leakage currents between transistors are isolated, further reducing the amount of power consumption you need and increasing the maximum switching speed. And simply getting the wiring right is difficult. So if you look at, you've got your transistors at the very bottom. If you're going to wire them all together, you've got layers upon layers upon layers of wiring. You can see that here in this etch away from the book, where at, underneath all this would be the transistors. And they've removed the layers of material in between the wires to expose the bare hanging wires, which interconnect everything. And so most chips today are now up to greater than 12 layers. And the materials they use in between the wires are what they call low K materials, really low dielectric constant, because that limits the capacitance between wires, which is important because then you have less charge you need to drive a voltage onto a wire. And, you know, again, pushing the limits. Look at this. You've got a billion transistors on a chip, 10 wiring layers, and again, how many wire shorts could you tolerate? And the answer is zero. You can have no wiring shorts. And so, you know, look at this chip here. These, this is just a zoom in of just a small portion of a chip. And you could look at these and say, well, I've got electrical shorts. Nope, there's no electrical shorts there. And so they are really pushing the limit of cramming everything on there without getting electrical shorts between these lines. And here you can see a multi-layer stack up of different, uh, of different wiring on top of uh, the, the transistor level. 
and they're constantly pushing things forward. Um, this is uh, some nice quotes from 2009. They were talking about uh, the, the sequence in which they process semiconductors and something called a gate-first high-K dielectric. And one of the, the folks high up at the, at the time said, well, at this point, no one knows what will happen at the 15 nanometer mode, meaning at this type of resolution. It could be that FinFETs come in by that time. Um, so they're saying that, you know, as they move, uh, they move from the 22 nanometer mode back in 2009, then when they get to 15 nanometer mode, they don't know what technology will dominate and what type of fabrication process they might be doing because it's so unclear because everything in, everything has such a high risk to it, basically. And so speaking of that, FinFETs, what you're seeing now is, is FinFETs starting to take over from conventional MOSFETs. So here's a, uh, a conventional planar FET like we've talked about, where here's the gate source and drain, and we make a channel in this direction. Okay. Well, a double-gated MOSFET, or FinFET, is shown here. And what this does, the big advantage it has is twofold. One advantage, which is lesser, is that here's my semiconductor, and I can gate my semiconductor from both sides. So I've got gate material wrapping around the channel from both sides. So I could deplete it or invert it from both sides. Right. So maybe I could get a little bit higher, uh, higher conductance through it. But the big advantage for FinFETs is the channel width is vertical. Why is that better? Well, think about the size of a transistor. If I look at this transistor here from the top, okay, I would see the channel like this, right? So it would take up this much area, it would take up that much area if I looked at the channel area underneath here, right? Well, if I look at the FinFET and the gate, if I look at the cross section of the gate in this direction and the semiconductor in this direction, your effective area you take for the channel where the gate and the, and the semiconductor overlap is much smaller. And so my crossover between these two is much smaller than I would have in the planar FET. So basically, all you're doing is you're taking a channel in this direction and you're putting it up here so you can cram more channels next to each other, more transistors, to get higher density computing. Um, here's, some, here's an SEM micrograph. Um, here's a gate of the drain and the source for a FinFET. Here's another FinFET here. Here's the gate. Here's the source and the drain. <laughs> if you look inside there, here's the semiconductor channel. This black stuff, I assuming, is, is the oxide, and this is the gate metal here. And here's a uh, curve uh, IV characteristic for a, a FinFET. You can see that for this particular device, you apply a negative voltage to the gate, between the gate and the source, essentially the gate, and then your current flow goes up by how many orders of magnitude? Eight orders of magnitude. So that's a substantial change in conductivity through the transistor with a voltage swing of only about one volt. And here's what some of these uh, FinFETs look like. This is an array of FinFET SRAM cells, pattern of 100 nanometer topography. Again, they all have to work. And it's, it's pretty amazing when you look at when they push the limits like this that they do all work. And uh, folks are now getting on board with this. So Intel was the first to do FinFETs. And, you know, others got a little bit behind. And so what Global Foundries do? Well, they said that they're allowing a 14 nanometer process to do FinFETs basically, leapfrogging Intel, which was at a little bit larger size. And so they're trying to go ahead to basically regain a lead. So the companies are constantly trying to one-up each other in order to, um, to achieve you know, higher, higher power microprocessors. And the nice thing about this, again, great reason to take this class, anytime they're pushing forward new technology, they're often doing it first in the United States. So you can see this fabrication facility is in Saratoga County, New York. And you can bet that someone like you that really learns semiconductors and would help push the next generation of technology forward is going to make a lot more money than someone working overseas on the old technology that's now dirt cheap, right? They're going to want to pay the best engineers the best money to bring out the new technologies, constantly improving things, and that's a great thing about the U.S. is a lot of the advanced R&D is done here. So we're almost about ready to wrap this up. Um, this is an inverter here. 
um, as we know. And then here's an inverter top view. If you were to actually lay out the materials using a computer-aided design type format, where you draw your metals, your ground, your, your VCC, like I have here. It's VDD, but it's the same as VCC. Here's my ground here. And you have your inputs and you have your outputs. This is how you lay it out top down to make your transistor logic circuits like an inverter here. And so looking at this thing, you have to ask yourself, okay, which one is the PMOS and which one's the NMOS? Well, there's two ways to tell, and it's a little bit to tell just based on colors alone. But I know I've got one transistor here and one transistor here, okay? Here's my input going to both transistors, just like my input goes to the gates of both transistors. Here's my output, which is coming out the drains of both transistors. Here's my channels for both, right? And then here's my sources. Well, I can tell that this is the PMOS device for two reasons. One, how we set up this inverter is the voltage was set up on the on the source of the PMOS. So this must be my source of the PMOS because this is VCC and the ground is on the source of the NMOS device. So this must be NMOS. The other thing is you'll notice that PMOS has this extra PNP, this extra different change in the uh, doping level out here to make it work the way we set it up. And so you can see that extra doping level out here compared to the NMOS which just has P and then N type materials here. And if you want to do further, you could say, here's NAND, how you lay it out, and you make metal connections, and you put the doping levels down in there and diffuse them in, and NOR. And at this point, you can start to build up a computer chip, right? So you've known enough now that you could start the basics of building up computer chips. So what are these? Are these what I showed you? Are SSI, MSI, LSI, VLSI, or, all, or ULSI? These are what we call small-scale integration. When you do a computer chip, it's VLSI, very large scale integration and some of the chips are now ultra large scale integration and you have medium and just large scale integration as well number of transistors and complexity of the integration so when you go to do VLSI how this changes is that you could be an engineer that just designs the best NOR gate and then you hand it off to the next level designer that uses NOR gates like you would in digital design so they look at it in terms of just the gates and then there could be someone below you that focuses on the semiconductor materials saying not only for the NOR gate but for any transistor how can I make the best possible transistor materials for these as well so you can see multiple levels of engineering that go into making a chip and it's okay to have fun as well um, so you can see that if you have leftover space on a chip people will tend to have a little bit of fun with that and so you could take the same patterning of metals and oxides and things like that in a chip and you can they essentially put things like in this case they says if you can read this you are much too close so this chipworks is a company that opens up people's chips and tells you about the designs and so they're saying that you're basically looking at our chip and you shouldn't be able to you shouldn't be doing this because you're trying to reverse engineer it and so you can do fun things at the at the micro scale if you've got the space left over but the space is typically reserved for other things and it's hard to come by okay i think we have that's all for mosfets again make sure you are solid on the start items